Welcome to the Move Smart Podcast. I'm Justin Goodhart, and I'm super excited to have you with us here today. Our goal here is really to bring in thought leaders to give you world-class tips in movement, mobility, strength training, gymnastics, parkour, martial arts, nutrition, wellness, meditation, stress management, supplementation, handstands, and more. We want to teach you how to build a movement practice, maximize strength gains, improve recovery, customize your nutrition, and ultimately develop movement intelligence. Our motto here is be healthy to be strong. Be strong to be useful and live long to maximize that usefulness. Because the longer and stronger you're able to pursue your higher purpose, the better every single person on the planet will become. I've got a really amazing guest on the show today, Dr. Rick Rose. I'm super excited he's here with us. He's got a resume about as long as LeBron James' arm, but I'm just going to cover a little bit of what he's done. Uh, He's author of The Six Pillars of Sports Recovery, a comprehensive guide on how to recover faster and outperform at the highest levels. And this book is based on his 17 years of clinical experience and working with a bunch of athletes, amateur, professional, Olympic, and from a lot of different sports. He's worked with pro cycling teams, martial artists, pro boxers like Gary Russell Jr., Tony Thompson, and a lot more. Uh, And he got his doctorate from New York Chiropractic College in 1996 and began teaching at the school after that. He owns and manages 11 multidiscipline chiropractic, orthopedic, and physical medicine clinics, excuse me, and is really generally a badass. Did I miss anything there, Dr. Rosa? No, that's plenty. (laughs) All right, great. So your book is called The Six Pillars of Sports Recovery. So can you talk a little bit about what those are? Um, Kind of developed from training and, and treating, you know. And, you know, I started to notice, like, one day I I had read a nutrition article about recovery in the office. And then I went at the gym. I was on the trainer cycling, and I read an article about the psychology of recovery. That's what sparked this whole idea. And while I was there, I literally grabbed a pen and I started jotting stuff down. It kind of dawned on me that there should be a much more holistic approach, you know. All I ever see is one article about this, another article about foam roller. You know, no one's really taking an approach to say, let's break down. What are the big pillars? I kind of went through every pillar that I can think of as to what holds up recovery. What's the basis of all recovery, whether it's from an injury or between workouts. And I started to think that, you know, this concept that we spend so much time on training and, you know, and very little. And so recently, it's gotten a lot better on recovery that if we kind of took the recovery aspects just to see is you have a huge window of improvement because we already know that training research and training regimens and trainers of all kinds, I mean, there's just something new and there's a lot of research on it. But when it comes to recovery, it's not like that. So that's what kind of made me write this book and started to develop this idea of the six pillars. Yeah, and I, I think that's great. I've often said that so much of success in training comes from what you do outside of training or you know what recovery habits you have what your lifestyle looks like what your nutrition looks like so just for the audience those six pillars in his book i'll just go over them real quick the first one is the awareness of what physical state you're in that awareness is is really key it's kind of the foundation for the rest of the pillars the second one is rest the third one is play fourth pillar is nutrition the fifth is physical or sort of active recovery techniques and the sixth one is psychology so dr rosa which one of these do you often see most people or most athletes struggling with or or neglecting i think the awareness of state of your state of being is often and the psychological aspects are usually completely neglected (laughs) yeah uh, and then I, I'd say those two are just non-existent. I mean, they're getting a little bit better now, but um, you know, the physical part obviously is always there with high-level athletes, and everyone kind of knows that they might need treatment or they might need to do something. Nutrition is there a lot now. You know, people kind of understand the nutrition of recovery and play. For the, some people, believe it or not, the, the aspect of getting away from your sport and having a download time is not at the pro level isn't that hard to get, you know, when you kind of introduce that topic, if they kind of get it and they either already do separate themselves, but you see that a lot in the ultra like overachieving amateur athletes, you know, with too much money and too much time, (laughs) they have a tendency not to, you know, focus on family, friends, hobbies outside of whatever that obsession is. I see that in those people a lot. 
And then the rest component, I see, you know, people can have a problem with that as well. Sleep is definitely an issue, but it's more intermittent. It's either when sleep's an issue, it's a major issue typically. And, you know, we're trying to kind of correct that with a lot of these guys. So, Dr. Rose, I hear you, I guess, talking a little bit about overreaching or overtraining. And there's a you know, feature on your blog addressing overtraining. Can you tell us a little bit about this classic symptoms of overtraining and, and how you address them with your clients? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing you'll start to hear as an outsider, not, not within yourself, is enthusiasm, a lack of enthusiasm, you know, that burnout feeling when parents or other athletes, you know, that just doesn't seem like he's enjoying it anymore. It becomes a chore. It becomes, you know, when you start to feel like that, that's like a big picture sign. Other things that you'll see is that classically, you'll, the athlete will say, I keep, I'm training so hard. I, you know, no matter what I'm getting I up and I'm doing these intervals or I'm doing this, but my performance level is continually gradually going down, especially if you look at it a projected over say six months or a year, that's a classic sign of overtraining. And fatigue is always a big issue. You know, a fatigue that just kind of won't relent. It's not like they're exhausted. They got to sleep all the time, but they're, they're more like lethargic. You know, they don't, they don't have that same level of enthusiasm when they're going to practice. They really got to hype it up. The tail ends of practice, they might feel more fatigued earlier on, and they take that as a sign that they need to train harder. So that's kind of like a broad paintbrush sign of, of what you could see now. And if you kind of are aware of your state of being, which is the first pillar, you'll kind of notice that coming, you know, but if you're blind to that, then you won't. And also sickness, guys that keep getting, or girls that are keep getting sick over and over again, that's another sign that you're overtraining. And, you know, I want to, I want to mention here that there is the classic overtraining, the clinical thing where you have major changes in hormone levels and blood counts, and you need to do blood work and you need to have a huge break from that training. But then there's also like a much milder case of overtraining where you can run blood work and it's actually completely normal. You know, and I see patients that are in that zone a lot, lot more. And you get them to commit to the recovery process and resting, and a lot of times you'll see a bounce back. But I think you really need to look at all these components, psychological component to that, the nutritional, the physical, the rest, the play, you really need to look at it from all those angles to fix it. And you can fix it a lot quicker than say, just saying, oh, you know, take the next week off and sleep. So you really look at all those components and figure out what the best plan for that particular athlete is. Yeah, that's incredible advice. And that first pillar is so crucial and oftentimes one of the most difficult to address with beginner and intermediate clients because yeah. they really see fitness as a grind. Yeah, no one gets excited on resting, you know? I get excited about resting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to hear. I thought I might be the only one. So you've talked a little bit about the stress of training and how we can overdo it. Um, with with that element, but do you factor in almost all of the stressors that they're facing in in their life? Like I've often read the research and the books written by like Robert Sapolsky, who's a who's a big stress researcher. He talks about how basically there's pretty much one physiological response to stress. Does the body basically have one physiological response to stress? And if so, then, you know, you talk about like micro stressors or maybe relationship stress or basically any source of stress potentially contributing to our, our ability to become overtrained or to not perform as well as we should or can in the gym. Yeah, I mean, I do think there's a division of good stress and bad stress. Uh, I talk a little bit about that in my book. There, you know, there's happy events that are actually stressors too. But you don't get the same level of physiological response. And I also feel that, you know, when you read PhD work, you got to remember these guys, they have a glass um, microscope. You know what I mean? It's hard to translate a PhD research one topic on stress into the real world. They love to do it all the time, but I'm a clinician, so I have to adapt and kind of infer from that stuff and figure out what it means in the real world, where there's infinite variables and just kind of use common sense. So I agree with that statement that, you know, there is basically one, one response, but are they negative responses or positive? So let's, let's hit upon some low-hanging fruit for our beginner intermediate athletes. What should every athlete be doing to enhance their recovery? I think the easiest thing to do um, is the first thing is if you're not using a foam roller, 
<laughs> you need to start. Because if you talk about all these recovery things and, you know, ice and heat and what, you know, all these new things that are fantastic, they fall by the wayside. And the one thing that you won't see in like endurance sports across the world is that, you know, massage is used across the world for centuries. OK, so that's never going to fall by the wayside. There's it is a huge, valuable asset to be able to do. Now, no one, you know, are professional cyclists and can get massages after every you know, ride and then between every race and a stage, but you could use a foam roller and having a basic, there's so many routines now on YouTube and books and you can get a basic quick routine. You don't have to spend an hour, but you could spend 10 minutes rolling out your quads, your hamstrings, your glutes, your piriformis, your back, and, and that as a basic cheap thing that everyone can do. The next thing as far as nutrition is concerned is just, you know, you could take a big picture look at it. You know, you don't have to go crazy with your diet. You just need to be eating what your grandmother and your mother told you. you know, eating more fruits and vegetables is always going to be a good thing for you and the more processed the food is the worse it is for you now the younger athletes have a tendency to eat be able to eat mcdonald's and then go perform and they just don't want to believe it until you get older and your performance is, you can feel the change i think a part of that is the awareness of state just because you feel you can perform doesn't mean you didn't harm it in any way so staying away from those things and, and if you're going to add anything you know making sure you hydrate carbohydrates and proteins after a training session i think is very important for recovery there's a million ways to do it it depends on your budget and if you have a sponsor or not. <laughs> But however you do it, you, you in whatever ratio, you know, there's a lot of ratios, different things we can talk about. The bottom line is your body wants something then when you're done. Don't wait. Don't let it sit there and starve because you're getting metabolic changes that occur and you want to provide it then. You want the recovery process to start right then. You want the muscles to take the protein, break it down and be able to form new fibers and net then. Why wait two hours? So that's another thing. Nutrient timing is really important, especially with youth. I think if you have a kid and you're really into sports and he's training and you want to do something, I think adding a protein, because a lot of these kids, it's difficult to get quality protein in them, is a simple, not you know, you can get Optimum Nutrition Way on Amazon for an inexpensive fee. There's others that aren't sweetened with stevia, which is more natural as well. But you can use that whey protein shake just to give the child some added protein because a lot of times you'll see that there's kids are so carb junkied out you know and even adults you know that's a basic thing that's yeah. going to be very for your recovery and then sleeping you know making sure you're sleeping is, right. is a very those are very good basic things low hanging fruit yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, that, that was foam rolling, generally eating good nutrition, what your grandparents or mom might have told you, uh, post-workout nutrition, and then sleep. I totally agree. Those are the low-hanging fruit, but huge, huge bang for your buck on those. So then in a similar vein, what are your protein intake recommendations for, for athletes to sort of optimize performance and recovery in the course of a day? I mean, it's really hard to say individually because I really do it more individually based on height, weight, and athletic, you know, sport. But I think I think people get crazy with this stuff, and I think unless you're even the professional athletes aren't doing the stuff the amateur level people do, it just cracks me up. I mean, they get so geeked out over it, and just because there's a study that was published or bodybuilder website that says you need this many grams of protein per kilogram there's some basic recommendations that's fine but i think if you get stuck on that you know you you can get a little crazy with it but i think if you generally add a shake of protein immediately after now i prefer to divide it okay so with my athletes this is what i do but you don't have to do this so the first thing i have them take after training is protein and it's just you know whatever i like a few different proteins if they have a sponsor we use that protein, right? Because they're paying some of the bills. And it's usually whey because it's, you know, it's absorbed quickly. It's highly digestible. And then they follow up with a carbohydrate drink within 30 minutes. So literally, because there's been some studies that show that protein available right away helps boost your testosterone level. No matter what sport you're in, that's a good thing. So I want to, I'm inferring from that research saying, okay, let's divide the two. Because a lot of guys don't like the protein, you know, that's usually the complaint. They don't like the protein carb mixes. And, you know, the best one is the one you're actually going to do, you know. So, you know, a lot of guys like the chocolate or the cookies and cream protein. And then they'll take their sweet drink. Usually they're thirsty anyway. So doing one drink in a blender bottle of protein with milk or water, depending on what they like. And then a, a second one with a carbohydrate replenishment, whichever one is out there is, is fine. Some are 
better and some show research and gut emptying and all this stuff. And if you have protein, it shows to be a little bit better. If you want to use a protein carb mix, that's fine too. If you want to just use juice, fruit juice, that's okay as well. You know, those are all fine. They're a lot cheaper than having to buy protein and carbohydrate drinks constantly. And depending on what type of athlete you are, you know, it's bang for buck, like you said before. You know, what's going to create the biggest bang for, for the money I'm spending is Absolutely. really important. And then at night, I think at night is a really good time for protein. I'm more like a like casein protein, which is a slowly digestible protein. That's when the body is kind of repairing itself. So you want to make sure it's available. You know, at night, we generally recommend a protein shake without milk, just like casein with water is chocolate or whatever. And that's my general recommendation. But you can do anything, any variation on that. You know, again, I like to personalize it based on the sport, the person. And my primary goal, even for yourself, should be, am I actually going to do this? You know, yeah, <laughs> so yep, the guy said, sure. just tell me I'm not doing this. I was like, all right, well, let's try something else. Let's try a mix carb to protein. Let's try just food. Let's forget about the protein. You just do your carbohydrate drink. I want you to eat this high protein meal. I want you to have a bag of nuts with dark chocolate in it, you know, and this is the size and, you know, that's got a lot of protein in it and you'll actually do it because you love it. Yeah. That's fine. You know what I mean? That's just as good. You know, one is, you know, why? Because there's three studies that show, you know, Optum Nutrition's way is high, you know, that's great. But three studies, 20 studies, you know, it doesn't mean that having a bag of nuts, which is a great quality protein after as well, isn't just as good. You know, who's to say that might not even be better? Yeah. So, Ultimately, um, it, it really does come down to what the athlete will do, what's in their budget and the quality of food they're able to consume. So in general, I remember reading a little bit in your book, you tend to have like strength or power athletes on a higher protein intake than something like, you know, endurance athletes or cyclists. Yeah. So if you're a cyclist, you're using protein in the mix to for literally for just repair and to help absorb the carbohydrates. You're not dealing with mass muscle, you know, constant muscle mass. You just want to help the protein will help you recover. It helps your immune system. You want to maintain a little bit. You don't want to completely break down muscle tissue, right? And uh, you really want to replenish your glycogen stores and, and, the, and the protein part there helps with both of those things. You're lifting, you're a power lifter. It's the opposite. You need to have a lot of protein. There's different recommendations, um, but you'll see in my book, I do recommend a higher ratio for that. You know, if you're a football lineman, these guys are lifting a lot more. Their strength and conditioning trainers typically will provide that for them, you know, already. But you'd be surprised. You think every professional athlete strength and conditioning is doing, you know, everything right, but they're not always. And that's the key. So so there is different ratios based on what you're doing. If you're strength training, you know, you're going to want to look and read a little bit more and form your own opinion. You know, just don't just do it because I'm telling you, you need to have two grams, four grams, whatever you think you, you know, based on maybe you read my book or someone else's book, you form your own opinion. Absolutely. And, you know, all the research that is done generally sort of follows a sort of bell curve and you have the outliers on either side who aren't going to respond in this exact way and i mean ultimately whatever studies out there you read it you sort of take that into account but then you have to do some individual experimentation because you have you know you're a unique biochemical cocktail and you may respond a little bit differently and absolutely i think that's great a great example and i think what you just said is what you know, I fight all the time. You know, people just, I, I argue that point constantly with other physicians and other trainers and stuff. It's just, I get it. I understand their point, but maybe this, this is a 10% or a 5%. Or you got to really look at what's happening. If things aren't changing for the better, then we need to try something different. I think being, again, it goes back to being aware of your body. And now there's a lot of monitoring devices. You know, we talk a little, just from when the book was published to now, in August, it was published. Now, the difference in monitoring devices are exploding. I still think they're not there yet for real athletic training, but we're getting close. And there's some things coming, I think, next year that are really going to be interesting for guys like me to, to kind of assess and analyze. And then eventually, you'll be able to self-assess and analyze. The programs will do a lot of what guys like me are doing. <laughs> so what are some of the tracking devices you think are useful for these athletes without breaking the bank? Which ones do you sort of prefer to use? Like rest wise, we use it because it's just a login tool and I like their algorithm seems to work as far as how well the athlete's recovery is. If you go to rest wise, you'll see it. I don't make any money from them. I know the guys very well 
and I've used it on all different kinds of athletes. Basically, you know, you're logging in a recovery kind of questionnaire with your pulse oxygen concentration, your urine color, your weight, um, your pulse, you log all that stuff in, and then it asks you some questions about how you're feeling. And then the, it's a weighted algorithm, and it's really over time, it shows how that athlete's recovering. And it's graphically represented, and you can app on your phone, and it, it's really nice. Um, I still think that's a very good app. I think they're going to continue to update that. The other ones, I don't really think they're good for athletes <laughs> yet, like Jawbones and Fitbit. I think they're more like fitness. People are trying to lose weight, maybe. If you have a sleep problem, yes, that's pretty good. It'll give you some information. But they're just not there yet. You know, people use them for a while and they stop, you know. And getting any athlete to do that stuff, it's so difficult, you know, to get them to do any of this stuff for them to get monitored. So ultimately, I think until it's completely passive, it's not going to really benefit everyone, you know, really, truly. Um, in other words, when you could put a shirt on or just a watch that will monitor more than just your movement and sleep, it will do other stuff. And literally, you don't have to do anything. Then it'll work. But it's also got to be used in training. So there's some stuff that's coming out. But I think the stuff that's out presently that you can buy, they're neat if you have extra money and you want to play around. But that's all they are right now. They're interesting and neat. If you're going to try to be fitness and lose weight, you need something that set your goals and your calories and that's fine you know i think that that might work for you but i think if you're an athlete and you're trying to look into recovery and, and analyze stuff you're probably not going to get much from it you're better off getting like a polar heart rate monitor and they have recovery settings in them sunto and polar that'll give you kind of like what i talk about epoch and they kind of grade how hard your workout was i think those are much more valuable because you can use it for more than just recovery you can use it for training monitoring and a few other things i think that's more valuable okay let's um let's change gears a little bit and talk more about rehabilitation i'm curious of your opinion on the role of heat and cold in recovery. I've heard a lot of different conflicting advice from many different you know, acupuncturists, physical therapists, and MDs in general. How do, you, how do you find heat and cold play in recovery? So I think what's happened with heat and cold is products have kind of pushed the concept of cold to a forefront. And I've been screaming about this since day one when I heard like High Road, the cycling team, was using dunk tanks to have their riders go in after their rides because it decreases inflammation, you know, of the inflammatory response. And I was, I can't think of a worse thing, dude, to somebody. Let's say ice is, or cooling is a benefit. Why would you shock your body? You don't think you're going to have a stressor reaction to that? You're going to change from 100 degrees to uh, 50 by putting him in the ice, I, I can't think, does that make any logical sense to you? I mean, really, let's just step back and think of that. Does that make logic? That's going to make him recover faster. I just don't, I, I don't, I never saw that. I never believed it. Now, if you have an ankle injury and it's swollen, you have edema or fluid, it's an active inflammatory sprained ankle. Using ice baths are, yes, awesome, fantastic. You know that, and you're also using ice with compression, these boots, they work, they're great. The Normatec, they're decent. But who's going to sit and lay and put boots on and get compression and cold just for training? You know, do we need to have that as part of your recovery? And the Tour de France, you know, doesn't that a stress just having to deal with all that? I think game ready, we, you know, is what we would use, which is just a wrap around the quad, just to cool the temperature down from wherever it was a little bit. That potentially can help recovery. But it is debated now. Problem is you need stress to make a change, right? In other words, your body's not going to adapt. So who's to say that you're not reducing those adaptations that you're supposed to have occurring? So that's the counter argument to using ice for recovery purposes. So I'm sure that's kind of what you're reading. Am I correct? You are correct. And you know, my response to that is always, there is a reason inflammation happens. Your body is not triggering an inflammatory response at random. And to immediately subject yourself to something like a cold tank can often be detrimental simply because you're bypassing your natural inflammatory response. I agree. The only thing I would add to that on a counterpoint that I can see is that cycling up a mountain for 100 miles every day for, is not a normal physiological <laughs> state of being. So I get that. So I think there is something to be said about that. But you also have to take it away from an injury, say, to your ankle or your elbow, where you're getting a lot of edema and fluid. So ice has really been bastardized. And, and the true way to use ice with an injury, okay, whether it's your back, your neck, those first 72 hours, you definitely want to quell the inflammatory response. 
But after those 72 hours, you really don't need to be using it, unless it's around an ankle that still has a lot of edema. And even then, we use heat. So I do a lot of ice heat icing. And, you only, and people use it too long. You should only be icing for about 15 minutes. If it's directly applied to your skin, like an ice massage, you want to be doing it for five minutes. If you do it longer, you get what's called the Huntington reaction, where you actually get vasodilation instead of constriction. And that's the other thing people don't realize. You're also using ice in the acute phase, not just for the inflammatory response, but to get rid of the fluid, to cause vasoconstriction, to help push the fluid through. So that's some, another reason why you, you use it. But what you actually speeds up the healing process is not ice, it's heat. Because you increase blood flow, you're going to increase the rate of, of removal of metabolites and introducing nutrients, et cetera, into the area that needs. So you definitely want to use heat. You know what I mean? You want to use heat to promote healing with any injury and in recovery. So I like the idea of using ice, heat, ice. Most of the time, I'm using either ice, heat, ice or heat, ice, heat very quickly, a lot of times before 72 hours. Yeah. And while we're on this topic, I think we have to talk about anti-inflammatories. Is that something that you prescribe for your clients regularly? And I'm a, I, I'm a chiropractor, so I can't prescribe any medication. But, you know, obviously I work with orthopedic surgeons and physiatrists and primary care. You know, there is a use for it. I mean, there are instances where it is valuable. It is a pain reliever. And it is an anti-inflammatory. It does help. I think it's okay to use. It's not the devil. You know what I mean? It's not the worst thing in the world. I all, I, and that's on one side of the, of the fence. I do agree that it can actually have a negative effect on it, the inflammatory process, a negative effect on recovery, but you have to weigh it with what you have in your hands. If you don't have to take it, then no, you, you shouldn't just take it like a vitamin. It's not a vitamin. I mean, I've had cyclists pop an eight and 10 while they're riding just to continue to ride. I mean, like a hundred pounds and you're like, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing that? You want to die? Well, <laughs> you know, I'm not kidding. So yeah, I had a guy who was a knee pain and a tour of California and he was popping a ton of them. And I'm like, dude, you can't, I got to solve this. He had knee pain. So, uh, you know, I'm like, dude, I'm here. Let me fix this for you. Give me a shot. But he's more of thinking that's the only solution. It was funny as he was warned, it was a time trial stage and I, I treated it. I taped it up, you know, to support the issue and kind of redirect the patella a little bit. And while he was, while he was warming up for his time trial, He's like, oh my God, it's going away. He's like, I can't believe it. You know, he's like, well, maybe it was a, the ibuprofen I took yesterday. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> open like, your eyes, man. <laughs> I was like, or it could have just been, you know, the hour we spent together. You know, maybe that's it, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so so I, de I definitely think people abuse and, and go to it right away. But I also see the other side, you know, from the medical side that, if you can perform without pain, then that's good, you know, and if you don't have any other choice, then that's good. If you're a little kid and you're giving your, you know, you're giving your son Motrin so he can go on the lacrosse field, then that's a problem. These are kids, you know, none of them are going to make money doing this. It's supposed to be about fun. Yeah, I have a problem with that. I have a huge problem with that as well. And I coach some, some youth gymnastics and it's really interesting because occasionally you'll hear a kid be like, I'm. I'm hurting and I need a pill to help solve this problem. And these right. are like 10 year olds. Like, right. Where does that come from? Parents is where it comes yeah. from. Everybody wants a quick fix. It's just people don't really understand that that's not fixing your problem. They say, oh, it's an anti-inflammatory. Oh, it's going to, that's great. Let's say it is. Your inflammation is gone. Great. <laughs> your body is still repairing it. The ibuprofen doesn't go in and repair the ligament. You know what I mean? Your body does. No one talks about fostering that, you know, God forbid. And let's look at why this person got hurt in the first place. Believe me, I have doctor friends that are that are physicians that are that are like, you know, oh, I went to the orthopedist, you know, our buddy who's an also an orthopedist, and you obviously don't have a surgical problem. And I'm like, dude, what do you what do you think he's going to do for you? He's not going to do anything for you. You're not a surgical case. He's, just because he's a surgeon and he's a gene, you know, I, I, my hat's off to those guys. They're the cream of the crop going through medical school. But that's their area of expertise. They don't know anything about this stuff. They don't care. They don't want to know. They might act like they know, but they don't know. They don't know. And this is where most of the stuff is. That's why athletes, you know, chiropractic was so popular um, and alternative medicine treatments with athletes is because they don't care. They want to they wanna get a change. They need to perform better. So they don't care what you're selling as long as it works. 
And in that crucible, you really find out what works. And ibuprofen isn't going to do it. You know, it can be helpful at times, but yeah, it's, it shouldn't be your go-to. And forget Flexerol and antispasmodics. That's the biggest waste of time known to man. Yeah, and you know, in myself and in the athletes I work with, I've been a big fan of using turmeric and curcumin, and I spent a bunch of time researching it, and it's it's really got some, uh, I mean, it was shown to be like as effective as ibuprofen, almost comparable to like corticosteroids, but without like the crazy side effects. I mean, it's like stimulates muscle growth and regeneration and like a pain reliever, but it has to be taken with like black pepper or some other agent to aid in its uh, digestion. But I've been a big fan of that because it doesn't carry so many negative consequences, I think. Yep. I have a few products that I like that I use and that's the way to go. You know, that's what I use. Yeah. I take them off the athlete for the nationals. That's it. That's it. You're done with that stuff. Now you're going to take these supplements and it's about supporting the tendons and ligaments and giving these particular products that are available to your body. And, 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 you know, a lot of nutritionists will say, well, you get it in your food, you know, you, you juice vegetables and you do, that's great too. But the problem is you, it's just so hard, you know, to get all these things. I think you can still do that and topping it off with supplements. People also don't get medical doctors sometimes and some of the laymen that don't understand, they think if you're supplementing, it's a vitamin, which turmeric is not a vitamin um, and bioflavonoids are not vitamins. So they don't understand. So let's let's start winding it up a little bit here. I want to be respectful of your time, but I had one to two more questions for you okay. if, if you've got a couple minutes. The first one is... What is the importance of a training journal? Have you noticed with your athletes, like, is this a really big deal? Is it key? And what sort of information should be recorded in a, in a training journal, if so? I, I think a training journal is huge. Um, it's an e you know, you talked about cheap awareness of state. We didn't even talk about that. That's a cheap awareness, the cheapest awareness of state device you can buy is it's a pencil and paper. You know, I think most people think of journal, training journal. They're logging in like every mile and their heart rate and their... You could do that, but but I think generally, I think what's really important is how you felt that day, uh, how you felt before you trained, how you felt after you trained is also really good for recovery because it gives you a sense of consistently being able to go back and look at it and then rate it, give it a number. Because if you really want to get geek out on it, you can give it a scale of one to 10. I felt like an eight today and you can elaborate. I feel like, a, and then you can go back, graph it and see over months where you were. And I think it's a simple thing that you can do. So you grade how you felt and then you grade how you feel the performance is. I think those are two very good things to include. Cool. So last question, just real quick here. Um, you don't have to spend too much time on this one, but of all the professional athletes you've worked with, how many of them do you see meditating or doing breath work or, or relaxation techniques? Not as many as I'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's difficult. Some guys come to me doing something already, you know, and they're really into it because they're kind of self motivated. It's harder for me to convince them to do that stuff. And it depends, like, where, what your background is. Are you from another country? And, you know, anything psychological, you know, are you kidding me? I'm going to breathe before I go to bed and that's going to make me perform better. You don't think I get looked at like I'm crazy when I talk about certain things. <laughs> You know, I learned that the hard way, like the first real client you get that's a pro athlete, you just bludgeon them with all this stuff and they're looking at you like, dude, what are you talking about? You know, it's just too much. So I kind of bring it along piece by piece. I mean, I think guys that are desperate do it and guys that are really under a lot of stress will do it. And then typically what happens is they like it and then they stop doing it, you know, or they're gung ho. But it, it's hard. It's hard to get people to do everything. And I don't want to make recovery a stressor. You know what I mean? I I, I put all these pillars down and I try to introduce certain ones that I think are going to give me a bigger bang for my buck as far as equity into how the trust relationship that I have with that athlete. And it develops over time. You know, usually I don't get them with the whole recovery protocol, even when their you know, agent signs them up. If I fix their injury, you know, which we didn't even talk about, it really is actual injuries, then I can get them in. Then they're like, holy cow, this guy just, you know, I couldn't, I have had the baseball players like for 10 years. I couldn't throw without some pain, but now I'm able to throw 
without any pain. And now they're like, okay, what else you got? You know? So I have this one athlete right now that I'm going to have to introduce this. And I know he thinks it's silly. So I'm not going to introduce it right away. You know, I'm going to hit on some nutrition stuff because that's an area that he'll accept quicker over the all-star break. We're going to do a bunch of that kind of stuff with him. And then that, the psychological stuff we're going to hit later on. Um, but I think it's so cheap now. I mean, you used to, have to spend like $125 on a stress relieving device that you can do like rhythmic breathing exercises now it's an app on a phone it's so easy if you don't like the idea of meditation and you it makes you feel like you're going to go to a yoga class <laughs> you know for guys or, or women then how about just relieving a little stress with some bre- a simple breathing exercises and there's so many options that you can try and you know you don't have to do it for an hour you know you do it for five minutes before you go to bed start there mm-hmm. most people i mean i think that's the the fir- that's the first place I start is the right before you go to bed with sleep hygiene, which I talk about in the book. And that's a simple thing. I think you get a lot of bang for your buck. If you can kind of relax yourself and settle yourself before you go to bed, you're not dreaming about the office. You're not dreaming about, you know, your kid stressing you out, whatever. You know, you kind of you have to step away or an action movie that you just watched, you know. You got to step away, do some breathing exercises with based on heart rate. And there's a million, you know, the stress eraser app is really good. I mean, you're talking a couple bucks, cheap stuff. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on this stuff. You know, I think that's the big takeaway is that you don't have to spend a ton of money. You really don't because you'll get a huge amount of money just doing the stuff in the book that I say that doesn't cost you anything. Let's say if it's a scale of one to 100, 80 percent of it isn't a lot of money. The last 20 percent. The last 1% you could spend a ton of money, but the effect you'll get on your recovery is really only beneficial at the pro level, where you're looking at half a percent, 1% making a big difference. But if you're just a recreational athlete or someone trying to be healthy, then living in the other realm is much more, it's much smarter. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important point. You know, building that rapport first before you introduce these breathing techniques to some people is very important. But the athletes I work with who I've introduced it to, you know, at first they may be a little skeptical, but from like a number of them, they're like, wow, I I can't believe how much like that has improved my sleep quality and and all these things. And they've, they've had really great benefits from it. Well, great. Uh, Dr. Rosa, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Guys, again, you got to get this book. Um, There's just a ton of practical tips in it. It's available on Amazon. It's called, again, The Six Pillars of Sports Recovery, and I I highly recommend you pick that up. Uh, Dr. Rosa, how can people connect with you? Um, I do have a uh, recovery doc webpage. The book's on Amazon. I think that's the easiest way to get it. You just put Dr. Rick Rosa in or recovery, sports recovery, it's in there. And then I do have a blog that I used to be very good at updating, but if you've been there recently, you'll notice I've just been busy with more children seems to be less time to update it. Um, but a lot of times if you go there, you'll get some, an article that I like that I'll see, I'll, uh, I'll copy and post there. Um, I don't do a ton of original article content because I don't have the time because I lecture. If you're a chiropractor, physical, a trainer or physical therapist or even an MD, um, New York Chiropractic College, I, I do postgraduate lectures. I have one coming up in the fall. So if you go uh, to New York Chiropractic College website and do postgraduate lecture, I'm doing one in Levittown, New York in the fall on sports and recovery. And if they, ever, they want to reach me, they can email me on any of those websites um, or they can buy the book. And then in the book, it's got my uh, email in it. <laughs> Cool. Good stuff. That, that you found me, so di- it directly comes to me at the end of the book. So, it, and I do answer, as you can see. <laughs> yep. Very quickly, I might add. So, <laughs> great. Well, again, huge thanks. It was a great honor having you on the show. Really appreciate the work you've done, and will continue to do. Thanks for having me, guys. Anytime. Cool. So, Sean, how can people get in touch with you then? So you can reach out to me through my website, redrevive.com, or email me at sean at redrevive.com. Cool. And again, if you're looking to get in touch with me, you can email me, justin at wellroundedathlete.net or check out my website, wellroundedathlete. Also on Facebook. And again, guys, I really hope you found some great information in the show, something useful to you. I'd really appreciate if you could just take two seconds and leave a rating and maybe a review in iTunes. That would help us out so much. We really want to get some ratings and reviews up. I'll post the show notes on my website, wellroundedathlete.net. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you next time.